good friends. Dan Botel works at FRP Advisory. He's a corporate finance partner there. And today's topic for you guys is tips on making an apps acquisition. Now, this is meant to be a bit of an introduction and a bit of an insight for you um, on that topic. It's not an in-depth kind of discussion. It's not too much information. It's just enough to kind of get you started. Maybe some of your questions will be answered. Maybe some of them won't be. Um, but again, the point is to introduce you to our network. So look, if there's questions you've got afterwards or you, you need to expand on something or want to tap Dan's knowledge, please feel free, get in touch with him, get in touch either at FRP on LinkedIn, however you want to do that um, and continue that chat offline. That, that, that's for you guys to do as you wish. Um, and, and just to give you a brief outline, it's just a one minute on myself, obviously, FD Recruit, it's obvious what we do. Um, recruit FDs really into businesses. It's more the SME space for us. Um, and what that means, I think, is anything from a startup to, to about 100 million, something like that. But that can be part time, interim, full time, whatever it is. That, that's, that's the scenario. Part of a bigger group um, that also do HR recruitment, accountancy recruitment, which is anything below FD. Um, that's our branch accountancy recruit. So finance managers, financial controllers, whatever an executive recruit, which do any other board level positions apart from FDs. I specialise in FDs. Um, but if you want any more information on our events or really anything else, if you want to join a community, a lot of you I know are on our Guild app, um, but some of you won't be. That's just a chat group for FDs, purely for FDs. So if you get any questions, anything that's going on in your business, you need answers to just join that group and just it's like a WhatsApp group. So put your questions on there. And there'll be other FDs that will be able to help you. They're better placed to help than we are. So, you know, it's there for you. And what I'll do is probably in this chat group, I'll probably send you all a quick message just so as you've got that link. If you want to join, by all means, do it. If not, don't worry. But it's a useful chat. Um, but other than that, in terms of how this is going to go, I'll do a quick intro to Dan. Um, let him do his presentation. In terms of any questions you may have, I think the best thing to do, because there's so many of you, we don't get to see everybody on the screen, unfortunately. So if you put your hands up, I may not see you wanting to ask a question. So throughout the presentation, while he's doing his presentation, just type me a quick message at Lawrence Underwood. Just type me a message. And at the end of the presentation, I'll try and get through as many messages, um, as many questions as I, as I can with Dan. So that just helps kind of Dan get through it. If you keep yourselves on mute, any questions, just fire them at me. And at the end, I'll address them with Dan. Um, and that's it. So again, a, a warm intro to Dan Botel, corporate finance partner, FRP. Um, and yeah, just doing a, a quick intro on tips for an acquisition. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Lawrence. Very, uh, very kind. Uh, very nice to call me an important person about five minutes ago. That's um, probably over <laughs> overstating it slightly. Um, I, I have put some pauses in this presentation, actually. I, I was meant to tell you before, Lawrence, just, just for questions. There's three or four points where people can ask questions if they've, there's something that's specific that's come up on the previous slide. So perhaps we'll just pause for 30 seconds. And if people have got a question they want to ask there and then, um, please, please do. Um, Perfect. So I have got a few slides, which I will put on the screen now. Um, I'm sort of working on the basis that it that it'll be uh, 20, 30 minutes of me of me talking. And apologies, I've got a screen here, one here, and one here. So if I don't feel like I'm looking at you, uh, um, I'm, I'm probably not um, looking at other screens. So um, as I said, there'll be some pauses in this presentation for people to ask questions if you wish. Um, I will send these slides around to everybody afterwards, so you don't need to take photographs or anything like that. I'll send the slides out. Um, my contact details will be in there. So as Lauren said, if you want to pick up anything specific afterwards, please, please feel free to do so. Um, so let's um, let's let's get into it. So I'll tell you a little bit about FRP first. So FRP is a, um, a specialist advisory business um, listed on AIM. So we've got 320 million market cap, about 600 people, um, and we focus across five pillars. Um, corporate finance and debt advisory being being the relevant ones today. They're, they're the pillars that I, I sit in. And corporate finance is all about buying and selling businesses. And, and debt advisory is typically around helping people raise debt 
um, or helping people re refinance their existing debt. And those those two businesses sit together quite nicely. Um, the other pillars, um, hopefully you don't you don't ever need the restructuring one, but it but it's but it's there if you if you need it. Um, and forensic services and financial advisory are two fairly specialist pillars that are that are much much smaller actually than the than the other three. Um, Myself, I have about 20 years of, of experience in uh, helping people buy and sell businesses. Most of, most of that experience has, has been in what I would call the mid-market. So it's businesses that, are, that are, have a valuation or are selling for between about five and 100 million pounds. Um, we do all aspects of corporate finance. So we do uh, sell-side work. Obviously, we help people sell businesses. We help people buy businesses. Um, we help people raise money. Uh, we work on valuations. We do management buyouts, buy-ins. Um, equity releases, uh, the, the whole sort of vista of of corporate finance we we cover, um, and we are a we are a national business, so we we work across the across the UK, um, but we also have in, international partners as well that we use. So about 30, 30 odd percent of the transactions that we do will have some sort of in, international angle to them as well as well. Um, specifically in in the corporate finance pillar so last year we did 84 deals um total value of those deals was about was about three billion pounds um you can do the math on that if you want the average that makes the average size about 34 million half of them involved private equity and, and we have about 80 80 team members across again across the uk that 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 average is is skewed um as averages often are because it includes quite, you know, quite a number of very large deals. So, so if I was picking the sort of the, the the median point, where where are most of our deals? What size deals are we working on? They're probably between ten and thirty. So typically, we're working, you know, the vast majority of our deals are in, in they're in that sort of space. Um, a couple of awards from last year and the year before, we won Team of the Year, Corporate Finance Team of the Year, uh, voted for by our peers. So. Um, you know, awards. You, you can you can make your own decision about awards, but um, these these are not awards that we buy. These are awards voted by other 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 people in our space. So I'm um, quite proud about those. Um, so, so Lawrence asked me to uh, to talk about something, and and I decided I would talk about acquisitions. And and these were the the agenda points I I sent him. Um, on re on reflection, uh, these cover far <laughs> far too much. So um, quite difficult to cover all of these points in 20 minutes. So, so what I've decided to do is to try and move it from the, the how into what, what, are the, what is the thought process behind some of these points. And I think that's hopefully going to you're going to be able to take some of those points away and apply them, you know, in, in sort of real life scenarios. So more, more about the why than the, than the how. Um, if you. Because if you think about some of these headings, you know how to approach targets. Well, how to approach a target is is going to depend on a lot of a lot of different aspects. It's going to depend on the type the type of target you're approaching, the size, the location, the type of uh, outcome you want to receive uh, or, or achieve, um, the ownership of that target. So there's 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 quite a lot of things that go into all of these these headings. And so um, what we what we are going to talk about is is, is are these things. So apologies, I have completely changed the agenda for this this call, but it's um, I think you'll understand why as we as we go through. So as, as a start point, we're going to talk about the headline stages for an acquisition. So that's going to give us some context about the process and 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 the and the following discussions. And then we're going to we're going to hone in on some of the the strategy and the assessment aspects of making acquisitions, and and we're going to pick 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 up a few points. Um, from a from a larger collection of points and which, which we'll talk about in more detail so um hopefully you know that is going that's going to be more useful than me just saying this is, this is how you do a process at a very superficial level we're going to sort of dive into some of the some of the strategic points really um so this is one of my pause slides uh so if anyone's got any burning questions after that please just shout up don't forget to take yourself off mute if you do want to say something. <laughs> if not, take, I'm done. No, that's that's fine. It, it's it, I'm I'm quite happy to take questions at the end, or or, or equally have no no questions. 
Um, so, so, so this is what I would what I would call, what I would call a typical acquisition process. So, starting at the left, um, and uh, well, I should say th this is this is geared towards a, a proactive process. So, when I'm when I mean a proactive process, I mean when you, the the entity, the acquiring entity, is proactively looking for acquisitions. So, this is us saying we're going to have a strategic rationale for this acquisition. We're going to spend some time working out what we want to buy. We are going to either make approaches ourselves or we're going to instruct somebody else to help us make approaches. Um, and, and we will do some analysis around that market and, and various other things. So this is a this is this is sort of captured as a proactive approach, but it applies equally to reactive approaches. So if as is probably more common in businesses, you you are receiving incoming, hey, this business is for sale, the, the, the same sort of process applies. There's, there's some slight differences at the front, but the same the same typical process applies. So we would have you know a kickoff a kickoff meeting a kickoff process which is all about what are we trying to what are we trying to achieve here what are our, what are our objectives and what do we want to look for so we spend quite a lot of time as you'll as you'll come to see working out what that might be there's then an analysis period and an approach period where you're starting to look at what you know what after your initial research and strategic thinking what 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 is that potential landscape of targets that potential population of targets that you could approach and how are you going to approach those and 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 typically you you would you, you have to you have to sell yourself a, li a little bit i mean that there is a, a a misconception i would say that you you approach people and and they immediately say hey that's brilliant i'm being approached somebody wants to buy buy, buy my business how flattering let me engage with you Th that that generally isn't the case. M most people, you know, are not that interested, and so you you have to formulate a way of of making those approaches in a, in a way that's a bit more compelling than just knocking on the door saying, "Hey, I'd like to buy you." Um, a lot of people will panic if if that's the case, and they will also think that you know something more than than they do, particularly if they are smaller businesses. Um, the, the, if if you if you manage to get a few of those people engaged. Based on your approaches, you're then into meetings and offers, um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in, in a second. Um, and then the, the the points on the right are, are really sort of sort of heads of terms, legal process, completion mechanics. Uh, once you've got past the point of making an offer, having that offer accepted, and getting into a period of exclusivity, so a period of time when you are negotiating on a on a one to one basis with that target business. I, I split these two things in, in, into, into two, really. And on, on the left, you have what I'm calling the strategy and assessment piece of an acquisition. And on the right, you've got confirmation and process. And, and, and what I mean by th those things are the bit on the left um, can end up in a bit of a feedback loop. You do some thinking about what you want. You do some research around the market. You make some approaches and you, and you reassess your criteria based on what what outcomes you receive there so you're you're in a you're in a you're in a loop and until you get to a point where something pops out of that loop and moves into the right and you're in what are you into a pro process a lot of the stuff on the left is information gathering and decision making and conclusion forming the stuff on the right is typically confirmatory so all the things that you think you know on the left you're trying to prove and confirm on the right and it's more process and so that's all I'm going to say about that, because most of that stuff is 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 not that interesting. So there are there are tactics around. If you look at this as a whole strategic approach. There are tactics that you can use in both sides, but the tactics and the strategy on the right is is fairly limited. So the stuff we're going to focus on for the next 10, 15 minutes is really the stuff on the stuff on the left, and. And the, the big point I want to pull out of this is about time. So acquisitions suck a lot of your time. And, and, the, re and the reason they do that is if you, if you compare a, a, a reactive process and a proactive process. So we have somebody who's coming to us directly and saying, would you like to buy my business? 
that person has already gone through the thought process, the, the ups and downs of making that decision that they want to sell their business. So they're, they're in that frame of mind that says, I'm going, to, I'm going to sell this to somebody. When we're doing it the other way around and we're approaching people, the people we approach may engage with us. They may say, oh, yeah, I'd be interested in that. But, but, they, but, but we're the catalyst for their thought process. So you can spend a lot of time talking to somebody, telling them all the things that are great about your business, how your business conversa- combination might be a great idea. But ultimately, they might say, well, I'm not, in, you know, I'm not interested, guys, really. I've, 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 I've seen enough. I've heard enough. And you might have wasted two or three months. And if you multiply that up by... You know, if you've got three, four of those conversations going on, you can spend a lot of time in that in that world and not make any progress. So having a clear triage process in in, in this side is, 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 is absolutely key. Having a clear view about what you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it, because t- time is the biggest thing that you will waste in, in this in, in, in this part. Um, any immediate questions on that i've had one come through already um dan but i don't know whether this applies now or you want to deal with that later it's basically um james has said it would be great to hear about how your view of the role of an accountant in an acquisition due diligence forecast integration tax planning that sort of thing how do you divide responsibilities between the parties so it's about the accountant's role and how do you divide those responsibilities is that something to tackle now I will I will come on to that and then if, if James has got further questions we'll 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 uh, we'll either take them offline or we can we can do them at the end. But yep. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that okay, very brilliant. shortly, actually. Thanks, Ben. So so this 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 left hand side of the slide that I referred to earlier, you know, here here are some things that you might consider as part of that assessment. And it's sort of it's sort of going into James's question a little bit now because these aren't the only things that you might think about. These are just a selection. So strategic rationale is the big one. Pe- people often cite that. So if you read a lot of books about acquisitions, it's you must have a strategic rationale. And and and, and that is true. You you should and you should think about how that how that works. Um obviously valuation is a is a key aspect. The people, both the people in the acquired business and the people in your own business, what's the competitive environment like? Is 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 that going to play a factor in? Or, or, or be a key factor in, in in this acquisition how it works and and, t- and tons of other um tons of other things some of these are internal points some of these are external points some are a combination of of both um you've got cult- culture down there at the bottom i've heard people say cult- culture matters more than financial performance um I, I will have a slightly different take on 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 that point but but it but it is a very key aspect of a lot of acquisitions um the the role of the the accountant in all of this is 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 this really so so how how do you how do you assess those inputs and outputs objectively and you know in the absence of a, of a better way most of these things get get put into a financial model so as people will take take these points and say okay well what you know what what does this actually mean financially and and the and the reason that it gets to this point, or or it turns into a financial model, is is because I guess a fundamental point about why do you buy anything? P- people people buy things because they perceive the value to them to be lower than the price that they pay, and it's the same principle here. The the the, the value to you as an acquiring business must be lower than the price you have to pay for it, because otherwise you wouldn't buy it. So all of these things that that we're thinking about, and I'm not saying this is the full list, but all of these things go into a go into a financial model. Now the the big issue with this is if you if you think about your 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 own business, and it, it may be that you're in different businesses that you, it's not your own business you, you're contracting, but the the principle is the same. Somebody asks you to create a financial model about a business you know quite a lot about. Well, that's that's still quite hard, and you know, I'm sure there are people on this call who are, who are excellent at Excel and can create great models, or people in the team can create great, great models. But how many of those models actually produce, you know, 100% of the right answer all the time? They, they, they just don't, do they? Um, I would be surprised if they produce the right answer half the time. 
so you put yourself in this situation now, which says, I, I, I've got a financial model for my existing business and I've got to create another one for the target business, which I know nothing about. So I'm going to have to make a heap of assumptions and a heap of estimations and, and loads of other things and come up with something that, you know, a board, a, a business owner, the divisional head, whoever it is, can make an objective decision on. And, and this is where the pressure falls onto the finance finance people. And, and you have to sort of, you, you have to realize that you, you're going to make decisions based on limited information. And, you know, that there's going to be a, a, a quite high statistical chance that you, the outcome of that decision won't be the, won't be the right one. So you, you've got, a, you've got a, bu- a bunch of stuff that you have to turn into a, a financial model. Um, we're just going to focus a little bit on some of these points and the financial model it's, itself and how that might play through. So if we talk about model, when I talk about a financial model, I mean a fully integrated P&L balance sheet and cash flow statement, typically for five or typically for three to five years. I would want it to include historic trading. So you can take the sort of that trading period into the forecast period and you can see that trend and how that fits together. The, the assumptions that, that make up the, the forecasts are driven by the historic performance and the historic working capital and the historic activities of the business. It needs to include, you know, synergies, terrible word, but, it, but, but a lot of that needs to be in there somehow. And it needs to stand up to diligence. Now, I've put depends on use use case at the top. It does depend on use case. If this is a purely cash-based internal transaction for a 100% owner who doesn't really care about diligence, then it, it doesn't need to stand up to diligence. It can be a it can be a much more basic model. But if it's if it involves bank debt, if it involves private equity, if it involves a PLC, if it involves anybody who's got a board that have put some rigor into these things it has to stand up to some third party um investigation and 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 building a model that you you can see where the assumptions are coming from historically into the forecast period is the way that you're going to make that a smooth process if 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 it isn't like that you will get a ton of questions about how you've decided what appears in that forecast model versus what's historic now that's that is a lot of work. And all of that work, again, typically falls on guys and girls like you. So underst- understanding that that's, that's part of the process is, is key. And, you know, another big point about this is prud- prudence. And I know, you know, we're, we're, I'm an accountant as well. We all, love, we all love a bit of prudence, don't we? Um, and and the, re- the reason you have to have pr- prudence is because generally... And I'm just going to use the word humans. Humans are optimistic about how things are going to go in the future. And we're opti- optimistic about a lot of things. Now, not everybody. My father-in-law is very, very pessimistic. But most people are optimistic. And so they tend to overestimate the outcomes of acquisitions and the, the skill, overestimate the skill of achieving whatever it is you want to achieve. And there's, a, there's an element of... Um, non-controllable factors factors outside of your control which you need to fa- you need to somehow factor in and there'll be bad luck there'll be other things that that, that come into this model um and and the, you know another big another big reason if you is if you think about a competitive situation so if you're in a competitive situation to buy this or to buy a business um the winning bid tends to be the person that overestimates the synergies the most. So if it's competitive and everybody identifies broadly the same benefits, the person who wins the, 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 the process is the person who overestimates it the most and therefore probably succeeds the least. So, so these, these, these are the ability to factor in those elements of prudence into a model is key at the same time balancing the fact that you've probably got somebody in a commercial role 
or a senior role or a CEO role telling you that the returns need to be better and this model, model needs to be better. And, and the trade-off there is really, really you have to be dragging other people into the formulation of this model. You have to be saying, this isn't all on me. I, ne- I need you, Mr. Commercial Guy, to come and sit alongside me and tell me that these assumptions are correct. I need you, production man, to come and tell me that these, these improvements we're going to make, uh, you know, uh, I've got some basis in reality. So that, that whole model process becomes, becomes a much bigger a much a much bigger thing and then and sort of doing it in a vacuum on your on your own is is tough and i think you know if you're going to make this work and you're going to be successful that's that's something you need to do and you, need to, and you do need to factor in that prudence to it um conscious that we're rattling through the time any questions on model models no good don't think so. So we'll, we'll, so we'll talk a few, about a few of these other other things now. So strategic rationale, which again is cited by everybody, you must you must have a strategic rationale. So some some of the things that that flow out of this are it 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 cannot be vague. You can't have a. It's I want, it's about geographical expansion. It's about adding more revenue. It's about. Um, moving into a new product area they're all far too vague these 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 things need to fit into a specific part of your of your business so there are there are a number of overriding archetypes which are things like if i acquire this this business here i think i can improve its profitability because i understand its cost base and i can make savings here 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 and here and I've got I've got demonstrable track record of doing that, and I think I can achieve that. Or it's it's a very early stage business, which I I believe I can take take on board, grow, and market much better than its than its existing owners because I've got market access. Or it's I'm going to acquire a competitor because you know we we both we both have huge plants in Europe. And I could I could consolidate those two th- things and, and make improvements. So it's it, it it can't be vague. It must be specific. And we're not going to spend ages on this because it depends really on the types of you know you could come up with a million different things for all the different types of businesses, but it must be specific and it must relate to the dynamics of your industry sector, company, competitive landscape. The next one about understanding your own business might feel a little bit. Um, obvious and some might be able to say well i do understand my own business but but you really do need to understand your own business and again and again when you're in that finance role do you have the access to everybody else do, do you do you understand everything that's going on and if you if you don't you need to involve other people in this in this process and you need to talk about the potential negative effects and positive effects of this of, of this acquisition and how how it's going to play through and then how that's going to play to in, in in your financial model. The final thing is, it it must be it must be something that you can't that you can't get efficiently. Something that you want as a business, and something that you can't get efficiently in an organic way. And I will put revenue in this box as being revenue is typically something you can get organically. So if it's just about adding revenue, that is not a great strategic rationale. Adding revenue because I'm moving into a new product area that looks like this, and I think the, the market opportunity is why that's better. So all of these things tend to add revenue, but just adding revenue for revenue's sake is not a good strategy or not a good strategic rationale. So there's a ton of ton of stuff in there that you could you could look at. But valuation is a, is a, is another thing close to many people's hearts, I'm sure. So when people look at acquisitions, you 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 often hear where where are we in the cycle? And you know, is 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 it a buyer's market, is it a seller's market? A, a lot of that is irrelevant because valuation is relative. You you know, what makes things a buyer's market, what makes things a seller's market? There are macroeconomic impacts to this, but but broadly. If you've got a business 
that um, in in this in this graph on on the on the screen, which is a slightly contrived graph, let let's say this is a a consumer business in the current environment. Um, the relative value of that business is up on the the y axis. The relative cash pressure that I've just made up is on the 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 x axis, and the the orange line is sort of tracking how I think valuation works for that business. So as cash, cash pressure is increasing, i.e. its cash generation is going down, the value of that business is going down. And and the, and the reason I'm saying that is because valuation is all about cash generation. So if you don't make any money, if you don't generate any cash, or there is no likelihood of you doing so in the near future, that your business is not worth very much. And, and, and if you think about where you might acquire that business across that life cycle, and I know this is made, made up and it's, it's to make a point really, is, is, is the best time to make that acquisition when it's at its lowest value? Or is it, or is it better to make it further back? Or is it better to not make, it, make that acquisition at all? And, and the point I'm trying to make is there's a, there's a very specific theory around valuation which holds true, which is if you don't make any money, you're not worth very much. Market timing is, is, a, is a little bit of – I would ignore market timing, frankly, in terms of acquisitions. It's either a good acquisition or it isn't, isn't a good acquisition. And, and it's based on a lot of different things other than whether it's a buyer's market or a, or a seller's market. And the public markets – influence this thought process as well because you can see public market you know public markets are going up and down all the time so valuations are going up and down all the time and technically theoretically it flows through to the private world but but it, but it doesn't really because there's so much other sentiment involved in in the private world and it, you know, picking up on a couple of other little points on on here is this this red line that I've drawn across is to try and differentiate between a seller who has to transact and a seller who doesn't have to transact. So once you get below that red line and you're on the way down, that, that seller has to do something. He has to do something with his business. Your, your negotiating position changes dependent on that. When you're above the line, that person doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to do anything. If he thinks there's going to be a recovery, then you, you, you maybe don't have to transact. So that line can be drawn in, in many different places and, it, and, it, and it's not necessarily about whether you're going bust, bust or not. But there are people who have to do things and de don't have to do things. And knowing where you sit in, in, in that line is, is key. And, and also, as, as you get, as the orange line goes further down, if you acquire that business as that orange line is going down, your cost of investment is not going to match. It's not going to follow that line. When it's nearer to the top and it's that business is operating as you'd expect it to operate and, and performing as it operates, your cost of investment might be quite close to what we perceive the valuation to be. But actually, as you go as you go down, that cost of investment is likely likely to go up. And so, you know, at, at my hundred percent cash pressure, the cost of investment might be forty and a bit. But if I'd bought it when the cash pressure was lower, I might be paying the I might be paying the same thing and. And, and factoring all those things into your valuation assessment and cost of investment and effectively return on investment. What what is my return on all of this? So, so what I'm trying to say is valuation is is a headline number that people use to assess these things. But actually, you need to dig further down to understand really whether valuation is is the is the metric you should be looking at, or or should it be return on investment or cost of investment? The the, the final thing to to sort of make make on here is, you know, our, well, two 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 more things really. Our natural inc inclination is to buy cheap, buy cheap, um, you know. But but this isn't a TV on Black Friday, you know. It's not the 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 the, the product changes over time. So if I know I'm buying a Samsung TV on this day, if I buy it in three months' time, it's the same TV. I'll expect to get the same performance. Not the case here. You're not buying a static product you're buying something that changes over time and you're definitely buying the future you know the past is absolutely irrelevant you're definitely definitely buying the future so if i continued that graph and that orange line went flying back up because um there was a huge amount of government support for consumer businesses and we're going to come out the other side of this 
those are the things that you need to be factoring into this this thought process around here so um the, the, yeah sorry the final yeah, and the final one so other expectations and behavior um people don't behave rationally particularly sellers of businesses so you might expect them to do a certain thing and 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 they don't so you, again you you have to manage that 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 aspect of this as well within within here um which sort of leads us on to people um and again there's a famous there's a famous quote about culture eats strategy for breakfast which uh, you may you may have i'm sure a lot of you have heard actually um which is all about saying you can have as much strategy as you like if you don't have the right culture and you don't have the right people you're screwed um and that that is true you know i i think there i see i see a lot of transactions but i see a lot of transactions that go well i see some that don't go so well um and a lot of that is around people because generally if you're making acquisitions you are acquiring a smaller business and that smaller business might be the best performing business you've ever seen but it's the best performing business because the ceo works seven days a week 24 hours a day and he commits to a lot of things and if you lose that when you acquire it you, that business value ev evaporates so understanding who are the key people in the business who holds the key relationships who 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 keeps staff morale high how does that culture fit with with our culture how do i assess talent how do i incentivize people in the future are all key the the, the problem you have when looking at acquisitions is you generally don't get access to any of that you, you don't you don't see any of that until well well after you've made an offer for that business so most most of that knowledge comes afterwards and it's it can be quite difficult to to back to backtrack if you've made something an offer for 10 million pounds and you realize that actually the, the business hinges on three key staff who all all want incentivizing at half a million pounds a year you might not have factored that into your financial model so you might have to go back around that loop and say okay well if i if i do do that what what happens to the to, to, to price if you've if you're on the reactive um approach then that that's maybe not a problem because the the, the vendor is engaged in selling so it, it's a negotiation if you're on the proactive path and the and he or she just says well i'm i, I'm, I couldn't care less what, what you thought about that the price is x you you can end up wasting tons of time on something that that you probably should have tried to find out earlier and this is back you're back in the box of you don't get all the information you want you don't get all the access that you want you're making decisions and things about well you're making assumptions basically um and so you need to include flexibility in that in that offer to try and cover some of these these points off um and and the la the last one is is another interesting one about fairness that there is a again a general a general view that that the way you, the way you buy businesses best is that you um you know you negotiate hard and and you and and you don't you don't really have much flexibility um p people like fairness people like to feel that they're being treated fairly and if you end up transacting when somebody doesn't feel like they've been treated fairly you will find that that people aspect of your acquisition evaporates very quickly as well if people feel like they're they've been treated fairly and they've got something out you know you, everyone's a, everyone's a winner then you will find that that's a much smoother process when it comes to when it comes to people um that is just about it so Okay, Dan. I've got one question. Going back to modelling, really. Uh, yep. Are there any industry standard models that people like to see by month, quarter, or annually, for example? Are there any standards? Or there, there, there are there are models that you can uh, you can buy, um, and I've seen some of those, which which are, which are very good. I, I have to say, and I can I'll I'll dig out the link to one of them, and I'll I'll send it around to people. So you you can get. I wouldn't say there's an industry standard. But there are there are certainly products on the market that you could, that you can use that are, that are not that expensive and I think fairly intuitive, quite modular, and then they sort of output into Excel um, 
and so you can you can amend them afterwards so yeah there, there are definitely products like that uh, the, the the reason i sort of bang, bang on about model is it, it tends to it tends to be the backbone of the transaction whether it's a you know a fifty thousand pound well maybe not fifty thousand pound let's say a million pound transaction or a hundred million pound private equity transaction that the, the financial model tends to be the thing that everything hangs off and therefore the finance person tends to be the point of focus and and it's and it can it, it can become an uncomfortable place um because you will get people like me saying where are all the assumptions for this how did how did you arrive at that number why is it going to grow from here to here why are costs going to go down and you, you don't have to have the, the specific answer you just have to have a decent assumption about why that's the case because that's all somebody can check can't check whether it's going to be right or wrong you can just check what the assumption is i've made an assumption that inflation is x therefore i think my energy bill is going to be this next year does that sound sensible yes it does tick whether it is or whether it isn't you're gonna you're gonna pass through that that assessment process brilliant thanks dan um now i'm conscious we're running out of time here because we said we were going to finish at quarter two so anyone that needs to go that's fine i'll just do a brief close um if anyone does have any questions uh, and we've got time by all means send me a quick message while while i'm closing down and we'll try and answer it if not look just just I mean, I'm an amateur here and uh, uh, and I'm not going to profess to be anything other. But uh, from Dan's presentation, I think it's pretty clear that it's very difficult to do an overview of this because every single scenario is, is going to be different. There's not two scenarios that are the same and it's so specific. So. For anything more than that, look, it's just an overview. If anybody needs further details, there's a lot more I think Dan could say on each point. And it's just, you might need to just chat to him because it, you just can't go through it. It's just so specific. That That's my takeaway from it. So by all means, just link up with Dan, um, have a chat. He'll help you through it. I mean, ultimately, he's got a lot of knowledge there. I'd say plenty of years, but I'm not accusing you of being old, Dan. It's just plenty of experience there. Um, so, look, anybody need any help with anything, just give him a shout. Give me a shout. We'll do a bit of a round robin afterwards, kind of send the screenshots to you. We'll put it online so you can access the video again, so you can watch it at your leisure. Um, the Guild app's there if anybody needs it. Look, just thanks so much for your time. I appreciate everybody turning up. Some old faces, some new faces. Good to see you. Um, and yeah, just keep an eye on our website for any more. We've got loads more coming up. So anything you need, just give us a shout. But have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you.